The placidity and prosperity of American life was disrupted forever by the 1960s. After President Eisenhower left office, his vice president, Richard Nixon, rose on behalf of the Republicans, while Democrats rallied around Massachusetts Senator John F. Kennedy. Kennedy's public personality allowed him to overcome his relative youth and his Catholicism to eke out a victory. More than previous presidents, Kennedy leveraged his personality as a political tool as he pushed his New Frontier series of domestic reforms, including popular tariff and tax cuts. His untimely November 1963 assassination lifted President Kennedy as a symbol of the nation's thwarted aspirations, and President Lyndon Johnson's Warren Commission failed to convince many Americans that Kennedy's assassination wasn't a part of a larger conspiracy to prevent even more optimistic changes in American society. Lyndon Johnson used the tidal wave of emotion after Kennedy's death to enact an impressive and ambitious series of great society programs, especially when his Republican opponent became Arizona Senator uh, Barry Goldwater in 1964. In 1964, uh, Goldwater won just six states, but his legacy propels conservative ideology even today. The legacy of President Johnson's great society reforms includes governmental housing assistance for the poor, federal aid for higher education, Medicare, Medicaid, and a federal budget that doubled between 1961 and 1975. Many Americans, however, began to understand that the expansion of federal programs, no matter their intentions, could not alone solve America's social problems. Americans living beneath the poverty line did fall from 21 to 4, or excuse me, 21 to 12 percent during Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty, however. The most difficult fight of the 1960s was that, was that of racial justice. President Kennedy was sympathetic to the cause, but feared the political fallout of Southern Democrats should he fully embrace civil rights. But the pre pressure for change was uncontainable. Blacks in the North were leading the charge against discrimination in jobs, housing, and education as early as the 1950s, and demonstrations against segregation spread to the South by 1960. At segregated restaurants and bus stations across the nation, an increasingly interracial group of Americans began to flaunt the rules in protest of unequal treatment, often in the face of violent opposition, including at the hands of nightsticks, tear gas, police dogs, and fire hoses. Violent events in Alabama and Mississippi, including assassinations of black leaders and bombings of black churches that killed small children, finally propelled Kennedy to begin to push for anti-discrimination laws on the national stage. <clears throat> Specifically, the issues he went after uh, were segregation and unequal employment. His public assassination, um, just three years into his presidency, made Kennedy something of a martyr to the cause of civil rights, just as the movement reached its fever pitch. Despite filibuster attempts by Southern Democratic senators, civil rights bills began to move through Congress um, in the months after Kennedy's death. Powered by the Freedom Summer of Civil Rights Protests in 1964, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 became laws under Kennedy's successor, President Lyndon Johnson. As the movement rolled up victories across the American South, the movement's attention uh, turned toward northern cities beginning in 1965. Although Jim Crow laws had never formally existed in the non-slave states of the North, de facto segregation existed in cities like Chicago, Los Angeles, Milwaukee, Cleveland, and Detroit. After a series of riots broke out in African-American neighborhoods in the North, the civil rights movement fractured into two distinct segments, those that emphasized cooperation with sympathetic whites and more radical groups. Those more moderate groups, in an effort to end housing and employment discrimination across the country, began to push affirmative action policies, arguing that data should be used to ensure equal access to jobs and housing. Against the increasingly slow pace and moderation of, civil rights, of the civil rights movement, other black leaders began to argue against assimilation and, and for a new racial and cultural distinctiveness. This new ideology came from revolutionary organizations like the Black Panthers, it was rooted in the faith of Islam, and stood opposed to the exclusionary qualities of white America. Malcolm X, for many, is as important a civil rights figure as Martin Luther King Jr. because he instilled in persecuted blacks a sense of pride they'd been denied even as white America had flourished since the end of the World War. In international affairs, as much as domestic reform, the optimistic liberalism of the Kennedy and Johnson administrations dictated a more aggressive approach to dealing with the nation's problems. Kennedy, in particular, was unsatisfied with the nation's ability to meet uh, communist threats in the third world, in areas in which Kennedy believed 
the real struggle against communism was being waged. He greenlighted the expansion of the special forces of the Green Berets. They were soldiers trained specifically to fight guerrilla, um, guerrillas and guerrilla conflicts. He supported softer approaches too, including uh, the Peace Corps, which sent young American volunteers abroad to work in developing countries. And of course, we still have the Peace Corps today. In Cuba, the Bay of Pigs invasion to overthrow Fidel Castro was fumbled between the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations, and it fell to pieces in just two days. The botched operation chilled negotiations with the uh, Soviet Premier Khrushchev, who was also unhappy with the mass exodus of residents of East Berlin uh, to the western portion of the city at the same time. In late 1961, Khrushchev had a wall built between East and West Germany. For 30 years, the Berlin Wall served as the most potent physical symbol of the conflict between the communist and the democratic worlds. This is in Berlin, so we've got those two halves. We've got the Soviet Eastern and the Western um, other half of uh, Berlin. And so now they're two independent countries, and Khrushchev has built a wall to stop Easterners from moving to that Western part, uh, to the pro-American side. Uh, roughly a year after that Bay of Pigs invasion, that attempt to uh, get rid of Castro and make Cuba, again, uh, pro-Western, a wave of Soviet scientists and technicians began to arrive in Cuba, and aerial photos uh, produced evidence that the Soviets were constructing sites on the island for nuclear weaponry. To the Soviets, this likely seemed a good defensive move. In fact, um, only a year prior, Americans had to, tried to retake uh, Cuba. To the Americans, though, the missile sites represented an act of war. The tense exchanges between Kennedy and Khrushchev over the course of 13 nerve-wracking days constitute the Cuban Missile Crisis, a time when we were on the brink of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Kennedy and his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, though, tactfully handled the affair and kept us out of nuclear war. The agonizing conflict in Vietnam, at first a, one of those minor third world struggles on the periphery of the Cold War, bounced between Kennedy, uh, Lyndon Johnson, and later President uh, Nixon. By the end of 1967, more than 500,000 American soldiers, most of them drafted, not volunteers, had participated in the brutal fighting. For years, policies of attrition and pacification failed to end the conflict in which swirled communist, Catholic, Buddhist, American, French, Soviet, Chinese, and nationalist Viet Cong forces. It's a complicated um, series of events that led to the conflict. Efforts to win the hearts and minds of the people of North Vietnam gave way, uh, soon gave way, to heavy-handed tactics like forced relocation of rural peoples susceptible to communist sympathies. The conflict in Vietnam disillusioned millions of Americans uh, and many politicians who watched death tolls and wartime atrocities pile up year after year on their television screens. The Vietnam War divided the Democratic Party into two major camps. Those against continuing the American involvement in the conflict in Vietnam tend to decide with John F. Kennedy's younger brother, Robert, or Bobby Kennedy, who rose in the 1968 Democratic primaries as the anti-war presidential candidate. Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy were subsequently assassinated within months of each other just later that year. So that's the second Kennedy brother to be killed in just five years. The 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago then was a mess of protests and debate over the party's future. Two Kennedy brothers had been assassinated, and conflict over the Vietnam War was acrimonious among the two wings of the party. Amidst that crisis, Richard Nixon quietly reemerged after his 1960 loss to um, John F. Kennedy to represent the conservative Republican silent majority in American life. He won the 1968 election with only 43.4% of the popular vote. The liberal Minnesotan Democrat uh, Hubert Humphrey did respectively, while George Wallace, the segregationist Alabama governor, siphoned off a total of 13% of the vote. It was really split. Despite all of the progress of the civil rights movement and the energy of the anti-war movement, the election of Richard Nixon made it clear that a majority of the American electorate was more interested in restoring stability than in promoting social change in America.